Greetings, friends. It's a joy to be together again in our circle. Coming together with the shared intention of the common good. We continue our meditative work bringing our group will for the common good, freedom and brotherhood. In the current cycle, as we work with the energy of cardinal and fixed crosses, we working with the topic awakening cross Christ consciousness through heart centered education. Through this topic, we relate to two themes that we rhythmically work with the topic of uh, new leadership that goes both in the spiritual and political realm and the theme of sharing introducing the new principles of economy of sharing into human life and so in this cycle, these two themes came to us through meditation, sharing and reflection. And today we come to have our another round of sharing and offering seed thoughts that could be magnified through our group focused meditation and radiated to humanity. Thank you for being part of this ongoing work. And I invite Rebecca to remind us of the purpose as it is focused through our work. Thank you, Alexander and everyone. Just refreshing our purpose statement, which is to support the manifestation of the spiritual plan for our planet through our group meditation, which aims to focus the power of our joint intention for the common well being of humanity and for Earth overall planetary life to enable the recognition and manifestation of spiritual principles in law and laws in all fields of human life and activity and to magnetize thought forms of solution that support practical action that lead to the advancement of humanity and the common good. And we recognize that as we come together in this way, we're intending to form an instrument focused on higher thinking um, and to, to endeavor to reach to higher thinking in ways that are pleasing and invite response from the spiritual world. So in this month of Scorpio or in this new moon, following this new moon time of Scorpio with our topic of awakening soul consciousness through heart-centered education, as Alexander said, we're working with the water element on the fixed cross. We're exploring this topic um, 
from the background of um, the idea of sharing and resourcing. So we've worked under the influence of Libra and Scorpio and we're really been across the month seeking, um, working within this atmosphere of seeking to understand how to balance the pairs of opposites by finding the fulcrum point of the scales in Libra and now in Scorpio through the great battle, which culminates into new consciousness and understanding and the triumph of the highest parts of ourselves in the initiations of Scorpio. And these are indeed processes of self-education, which can bring us to a place of heart-centeredness and strength to share and serve, share with others and serve. So within all these threads and influences, we come together today, beginning the forming of our instrument of listening and thinking through our group alignment process, beginning with the naming circle. So I hand over to you, Tracy, to lead us in that process. Thank you, Rebecca. As we begin our focus today in this new moon meditation, the naming circle unites our hearts across distance. As we begin our alignment and bring ourselves fully into our group work, By uniting our hearts in this way, we begin naturally to work telepathically through our group mind. The key to this telepathic work is in the etheric alignment, which creates the group field and allows it to become both a receiving and transmitting agent for higher ideas and energies. We will begin by calling our names into the circle, starting with our organizers. And as your name is called, please unmute yourself, say your name, and where you are calling in from. For example, Tracy Arbor calling in from Novi, Michigan, USA. And as we go through this, let us turn our attention to our hearts and the heart center of the group gathered today as each one of us calls ourself into this circle. Alexander. Alexander Ilchuk calling in from Brooklyn, New York in the United States. Welcome. Rebecca. Rebecca Hood calling in from Mapleton in Queensland on the east coast of Australia. Welcome. Annetta. Annette Lüffler calling in from Soru in Denmark. Welcome. Jillian. Hello, everyone. Jillian Douglas from Norfolk, UK. Welcome. Judy. Uh, hello, this is Judy Harrison from Brewster, Massachusetts, USA. Welcome. Kathy. Hello, this is Kathy Heller calling in from, from Hawaii in the USA. Welcome. Leslie. Hi, Leslie Van calling in from Arizona, USA. Welcome. Lynn. Hello, um, this is Lynn Green calling in from Columbus, Columbus, Ohio, USA. 
Welcome. Maria Cristina. Uh, greetings, Maria Cristina Donadio, calling in from Tucson, the Arizona Sonora Desert, USA, Mexico landscape. Welcome. Michael. Hello, everyone. This is Michael calling in from Hawaii. Welcome. Tina. Hello, this is Tina Hutchings from Castle Rock, Colorado, USA. Welcome. Tunji. Would you please unmute yourself? Well, with some issues with the microphone, and Tunji is joining us from Sunshine Coast, Australia. And I see Tunji rejoined from a different device. Tunji, try to unmute yourself. Uh, hi, this is Tunji and Rebecca from Mapleton, Australia. Welcome. Thank you, everyone. Now that we are linked together as a group, let us share a few moments in silence to align forming a triangle between Shambhala, the hierarchy, and humanity. May our efforts be of the highest vibration and selfless service for our purpose. Thank you, friends, and thank you, Tracy. So as our monthly ritual goes, we open our circle now for sharing. 
And as we listen to each other, let us hold our group cellos as receptive vehicle for all the impressions coming. Listening through each other's sharings, the higher note, and as each next sharing is added to the cellist, we recognize the opening perspective for us to perceive the higher truth through listening and active focus. Uh, in the chat uh, window, you can see the link to our community impressions board that's been open since the full moon and uh, uh, some ideas already been shared there. So we invite you to uh, check it and uh, to start our conversation and just remind us to questions that was offered to us during the full moon meditation to help us to focus on the topic and to start the sharing today. If you would like to share, please uh, raise your hand. Uh, if you are muted, or just unmute yourself and share. Julian, please. Um, hello, I um, have been thinking about education for a while. Uh, I belong to a group that looks at the 17 sustainable goals and the goal we were working on uh, this week is humanity declares the fact of soul to create, learn and grow. And that's quality education, which is the fourth goal. Um, so in thinking about quality education and the idea of soul, the idea of oneness uh, is really the place that we need to begin uh, in order to open up to Christ consciousness on any level. And um, just the idea of uh, being a global citizen uh, is, I think, an important concept and something that really has to be looked at uh, where we're learning really how to live in the world together. I think uh, when we talk about uh, touching Christ consciousness, it has to be in manifestation. And so that has been one thought, uh, the idea of even in uh, this country, uh, citizenship. What does it mean to be a good citizen? We're talking about leaders, but we also need um, everyone that's part of a system. So I think uh, those are some of the thoughts that I've been playing with uh, in terms of education and how to move into that next uh, heart-centered iteration of it. Hi, Jill here. Um, as I'd already written this, it uh, goes a bit far, some of it, so I hope it's um, all acceptable. But I've been thinking <clears throat> lately that education should be seen as just the beginning of learning about life and nature, and it will carry on in further incarnations. Those learning will be encouraged to see themselves as a tiny essential part of the universe with a role to play in its welfare. They will learn that their role on earth will be one of love for the whole, 
and that will must prevent them from being deflected from their work. They will learn to understand that Earth is one part of a much larger group of heavenly bodies, each with their own life forms that are unlikely to be identical to human form. Human physical bodies will become obsolete when people are able to focus their consciousness at higher levels. It will be understood that harm comes from lack of true love, not from differences. Causing harm should be avoided by love. And uh, this came up at our COP meeting. Good parenting skills should be encouraged and developed with all society taking their role in the endeavor. Altruistic leisure pursuits should be encouraged and facilitated with time allocated to meditation. As space travel develops, the exchange of energies between heavenly bodies should be more widely known and respect for other heavenly bodies should be expected. If and when reached, they should not be plundered and depleted of their assets as the earth has been. People should be taught the laws of nature. Thank you. I'm going to build on that very simply. This is Michael speaking. Uh, the law of love as given in uh, the writings of Blavatsky, Bailey, and Agni Yoga is described as the law of the universe, uh, but it's also a systemic law. It seems to be incumbent upon all of us to understand what love is and uh, work diligently to, from our understanding, follow this law of love. Uh, my take on it from a systemic standpoint is uh, that we should be harmless, selfless, and speak rightly. And from standpoint of law of the universe or of source is love is all. Thank you. To extend some from what Jillian said, this is Lynn, to extend some from what Jillian said, I think um, it's important um, that people are um, in taught to see what their true nature is um, in all of their vehicles at every level of consciousness, the physical, etheric, the emotional, the mental, and the spiritual. Um, if they, if we can um, recognize what what is happening, whatever level we find students say, we have to accept the level they are and to try to help them to discover what is true about themselves, um, leading to uh, the recognition of their true spiritual nature. Um, but we have to developmentally take people where they are, just as DK talks about um, recognizing. Um, our level of discipleship or level of uh, of um, spiritual experience. Um, and then once people can see more clearly where they are, um, what their needs are, how to appropriately um, meet those needs in harmless ways, um, I think that will make a big difference and help us to minimize distortions and um, um, over emotional responses and pr projections that we put onto the world and other people that are not based on, on truth. I think that will be very helpful if we can eventually do that. And there are people working on that. Um, for instance, there's a preschool where I live that you folks, many of you have heard me talk about. And um, 
one technique they well, they have certain phrases they use with young children, three, four, three and four mainly. Uh, for instance, when a child tells a whopper, <laughs> a real lie, um, they'll um, get to the level of that child and uh, look them right in the eye, um, not punish them, but say to them, that is what you truly wish had happened. You really, really wish that was what had happened. And already they're teaching to discern between uh, the emotional wish life and physical reality and mental reality um, without taking away um, respect for the child or love for the child. So things truly need to be age appropriate, but I think we need to uh, help help people see what's true about themselves at every level um, and help them by that um, inspire them hopefully to, there's been a lot of talk of inspiration which is so important, um, but that way I think we open up the ability for them to imagine and be inspired and not f constantly be fighting themselves and their own nature. Okay, thanks. Um, this is Maria Cristina. I would just first comment on Alexander's opening words of awoke, just in general, of awakening the common good, um, freedom and brotherhood, I believe were mentioned. And this was very invocative of the Lords of Liberation which are, you know, equality and liberty and fraternity or brotherhood. That freedom, the common good under, could go under the equality, you know, diversity and equality, the common good. And these are meant to be words which govern the new civilization. And my thought as I listen to people turns to words from the Tibetan given an education in a new age where he very specifically outlines um, the involvement of a person through indeed the physical as has been mentioned and the emotional natures you know when you're little and you're learning to maneuver your body and then the emotional oh my goodness adolescence and so on or in the heart center is evoked and the mental but basically then leading to the um to the antakarana to the tech to the science of the antakarana which is of course, the spiritual, which is where the book itself leads. And he describes education as, as basically that. And emphasizing, yes, the, the past history, which or the past knowledge with which we are inculcated. Um, but then looking towards the future and from the lower mind, as, this, as it is processed or as it grows and then turning to the higher mind and bridging between um, the personality and the soul indeed so that would be wonderful that then the receptive mind the individual mind the illumined mind so Education, thank you.
the building of the Antakarana. To add to that, uh, there is a quote from uh, The Act of Will by Roberto Sagioli that says, the etymology of education, educare, expresses its true purpose and function to draw out the latent possibilities from the unconscious, to activate the energies dormant in it, particularly in its highest sphere, the superconscious. We are told to do this by DK, I believe, through study, education, and service. And it's uh, such a hopeful sign, I feel now, that there are so many opportunities, at least where I am, for those, for study, um, for meditation, um, in various forms. And of course, there are always service opportunities around us, um, even in the schools. <laughs> uh, people are needed. So um, um, it's a good time. It's a good time to be living. And I believe there's so much happening right now, as I, I'm sure you all agree with. Uh, there's just so much going on right now in these areas. I have to agree. There's, I mean, just the fact that we're talking about one world and one family. I mean, that's happening, be it because of the pandemic or the interrelatedness of economics. Borders are no longer contain peoples. So there is that sense of the one world and the climate change. And there is that sense of, of the constitution of man, as is said in the esoteric studies of the you know, physical, emotional, mental, and indeed spiritual. And then I would just say that the psychology that is also bringing so much truth and interest, introspection. And lastly, I think, as I recall, what is mentioned in that book is to bring in the science of the seven rays, which is kind of an interesting thought. The nature of individual problems or racial problems and how we relate to each other, I think um, will become clearer as through the growth and the development of the science of the seven rays. Uh, I think when, as the hierarchy externalizes and the Christ returns to earth, they will have an, a very great effect on guiding the educational system in a better way. 
Thank you. Yeah, I think we um, discussed this in previous uh, gatherings together about the autistic kids that have come in and change the way that uh, we are looking at education because we don't all fit in a box. Everyone is individual and different. And it was brought up about the rays, which were all made up of different rays, of course, also. And we all come in with different gifts and talents to share. And um, one of my teachers, Dr. Douglas Baker, mentioned that probably within 100 years, uh, they'll be doing ray analysis in the schools, usually in the middle school type uh, age group, starting with them and doing ray analysis to help guide these um, children into uh, areas where they are best, uh, can best uh, contribute their, their skills and gifts and uh, bring joy to what they're doing, which is, um, you know, what we're all, what it's trying to do. A lot of people go to school just to get the education to make the paycheck and, um, you know, of course, help society in some way, but uh, sometimes that gets lost. Um, I think a lot of the kids get lost in the system. So um, I do think that what was just said about the hierarchy and the coming of the Christ, I think things will change um, and it will become more, I don't, I want to say individualized, um, but not separative, most more synthesized, because these kids um, coming in the future will know who they are, where they're coming from, what talents they have, and they can blend with each other much better and be supportive of each other as they go through life. So thank you. I think in a way it's more basic than that. I think that we have to understand that everyone in the world deserves a quality education um, because that's not happening now. We have to shift our focus and act as a planetary group and look at how we educate the children of the world. We have to shape shift from thinking about my community and the children I know and those kinds of things and have a more global attitude. And it's basically, to me, the nations of the world um, have to look together and solve the problems of how we work together to live on a planet. It's, it's the beginnings of Christ consciousness in terms of an awareness that we are one and we need to work together. So I think when I think of the Aquarian shift, um, top-down work sometimes, sometimes you have to really work um, as a group whole from the bottom up. I agree with Tracy that um, part of that bottom up um, needs to be again seeing seeing at a local level. Uh, I mean, there's there are group expectations at a local level, and that's going to have a large influence. But if we can see each individual child uh, to some extent for who they are, um, that and help them see who they are, I think uh, again ray analysis. Um, other things that are happening now that seem to be heading that direction are um, um, learning styles, studying learning styles, um, trying to um, um, make education, ex educational uh, techniques fall into line for each different learning style in a classroom, offering opportunities for various learning styles. I think that is a, is a, a going in that direction. Um, but then it's so important, as you just said, uh, that the whole world sees that each person deserves an education. Um, so um, how do we make that all work together? And um, um, how do we, how do we um, actually see 
others in the world, no matter what kinds of choices they make, try to see behind what, what's involved in that choice um, and, and recognize it as valid. Um, and that, that's a real challenge, I, I believe, to see what's valid in the perspective of so many different people in regards to um, um, individuals. For instance, just knowing that we all uh, stem, our needs stem from different things our souls are even directing us to do. Are we being directed to um, experience um, uh, just basic learning uh, from our physical world? Is that our priority? Um, and, and I think all of us come in in different places with this in different lifetimes. Are we needing to start a whole series of lessons um, that we've worked on for several years? Are we needing to, are we experienced with these things we're trying to bring forth? Um, are our souls experienced? Are they trying to start something new? Um, so are they trying to start to be more physically and instinctively directed to define that? Are we, are we here for more social experiences that will develop our perspective? Have we learned a lot about ourselves already? And are we using more using our minds to give back and experience what's most important about ourselves to serve? Um, are we so focused on what we've learned already in the series of lives that we are just serving. We're basically serving through our intuitions. I mean, there are children come in too with these various priorities. And um, it's a challenge too for all of us that we can, I know we can do and eventually, but we, I, I know we need to keep working on all of this awareness that we're talking about. And I know for my, my younger brother came in uh, to, this, to his life, um, having prepared a lot for it ahead of time. So he, his whole approach was so different than mine um, because I came in more seeing some sort of vision and trying to figure out what's, what's valid about it all at all, whereas another young brother came in starting again and his whole life was so instinct, has been so instinctive. Um, Yet there, you know, all three of us have valid life experiences. And um, my dad was sort of more of a social fellow. And so his experiences were even different from his children. Um, and yet all valid experiences and all valid means of studying, means of experiencing, means of growing. Um, it's hard to make our minds, I think, large enough in concept to include all of these things. Yet here we are trying. Uh, and it's a pretty exciting thing. Thanks. Hi, it's Rebecca. Um, listening to all the threads and um, something that's um, coming up for me is um, a webinar that we held some years ago when we were looking at the sustainable development goals and we were looking at education and um, Tara Stewart and Doug, I can't remember his name, were presenters at that webinar. Um, and uh, what's just really alive for me is Tara's description of her own practical experience. Um, I think it was working with children in Africa and the responsiveness of her approach to the group that she was working with and um, what ended up being important in education for them was I think gardening and learning how to grow food, um, that it was things that were to do with their life and what their needs were in their life. Um, <clears throat> so, and, and I, Feel like this is really relevant <clears throat> for this idea that has come up about <clears throat> it seems to be the idea of the relationship between the individual and the group and that gets 
<clears throat> reflected out, resonated out like a fractal into this idea of, you know, global education and then the idea of the child as an individual and um, <clears throat> it just seems really important what's being said about, um, so there's the child as the individual within the class group and within the school um, and then there's the individual school within the greater community and there's the community and that folk soul within the greater population of the world and I think that all of these layers are part of the richness of um, what needs to happen to meet the educational needs of everyone worldwide um, and so when we try and think of you know being fair and bringing equality to the world and for everybody to have an education it's important for these factors to be a part of that um, process of thinking because otherwise the we could easily get led to a sort of place of standardization um, which takes away what needs to happen for spiritual growth so i think that's a really um, important thing that's come up in our conversation well, there's a couple of two other things that i'd like to talk to as well um, and last time we were speaking and building up our thinking across the month um, i brought up the um, the issue issues that are in schools um, in Australia and in Queensland in our area and I think across many other Western countries as well um, of expulsion of students who are going off the rails or having difficulty or um, you know have behavioural problems and don't fit into the system. Um, and so there's a there's a pattern of excluding those kids from school as a way of dealing with discipline. Um, and there are groups of kids who are um, economically disadvantaged or socioeconomically disadvantaged. And as Tracy brought up as well, there are um, many children who are disillusioned and young people who are disillusioned and who are suiciding. Um, so um, these things suggest that what we're doing for young people isn't meeting needs and isn't enough. Um, and so that takes us to the point of thinking about the heart-centeredness and the importance of the heart connection to be able to enable people to come to who they are and to be able to engage with the process of education. And um, I spoke last time about restorative justice. Um, someone spoke about the Montessori education where the, the um, teacher shakes the child's hand, every child's hand before they come in, as they come into their class in the morning. And these are things that seem really important you know, we speak about the Christ consciousness, but on the ground, these are the things that allow us as human beings to align with the Christ consciousness. They're, they're the expression of the recognition, the namaste, I see you, um, the expression of um, respect for who the person is. And to bring that into education, seems like a really important antidote to this um, situation that we're getting where, where the schools can't understand and manage the behaviour of young people and human beings who are struggling. Um, so I think it's really important to look at those things and and this this is the expression of the law of love on the ground. This is what we need to do. I feel <laughs> I'm expressing my opinions here, um, but from having thought about these things and offering that into the circle, um, 
in relation to that, I think a really important thing is what the atmosphere of schools is and what the education system, how can the education system um, nurture positive and supportive atmospheres in schools, wherever they are on the globe, in the globe and whatever community that they're in. And I guess that there needs to be some kind of freedom and self-determination for schools to be able to um, make the environments loving and make the environments that suit their community and speak to the needs of their community. And um, the teachers need to be supported. So we need to find, think about ways that schools and our, and our systems can support teachers because the teachers need to be Christ-centered, they need to be heart-centered. And if they um, run ragged with large class sizes and with um, curricula and the need to meet all of these standards and everything, um, the heart consciousness and the um, social education can often get put on, on the back burner. So I think there needs to be space in our way that we have education for teachers to develop themselves and be rich human beings themselves that are finding themselves and their own relationship to love and the Christ. And for them to then have some self-determination in how they bring that into the education process. Um, and then the last thing that I'd like to speak to is um, something that a word that came up in what Lynn's most recent um, contribution, which was experience, experience kept coming up. And I think that um, education needs to be, learning needs to have experience in it. And that means, doesn't only mean, you know, building gardens or, um, but it means how we experience knowledge and how we think means how we experience each other and how we experience love on the ground as respectful relationships within the schools and um, within the community. Um, I agree that the teachers are key. Um, I had a spell as a learning support assistant in a further education college and a lot of the students didn't want to be there but they were getting some money for being there to keep them off the streets basically. Others wanted to do a certain profession when they um, could but they hadn't passed their maths and English so that was the bit where I was helping in with that. Um, to try and get them through their exams so that they could follow their profession they wanted to do. Uh, but the teachers, some of them were abysmal really. They didn't really want to be doing the job. They were working until their pension came along and things like that. You've got to have enthused teachers to help. And uh, I noticed that a lot of the girls that were very academically lacking went in for childcare and such things as that. And that's a rather worrying thought as well. Thank you. Yeah, I think I'd like to second all that and um, say that to me, what's coming through quite a bit is these two words, relevance and connection. So um, trying to stay away from in the box type education, uh, depending on, on where, where, the, where everyone lives and what their circumstances, um, you know, there's different communities with different circumstances. And I think education needs to be relevant to what is needed for that, um, that area and I mean I think uh, you were talking about the African um, experience with them and and there was a book I read and, and uh, I forget the name of the book um, but it had to do with uh, 
several people went and collected books and went to Africa. They were going to teach the children. And when they got there, the children weren't concentrating on education. They had to go get water that was like an hour away every day. They had to go bring water in. So um, I think having open dialect and open uh, communication and connection with everyone uh, in the community, that's what needs to be, happen first. Um, not everyone is made to be a math professor or whatever, you know, you, we need people that can work on, uh, you know, our, our home, building homes and, and different things, you know, our uh, fixing our clocks or whatever. But um, I think relevance and connection, if we can connect with the individuals and smaller, obviously, in the old days, when I went to school, we had smaller classrooms. Well, smaller are more intimate, so there's more connection. So even though we're having a large population now, I think in the education system, something needs to be seen where we have maybe a classroom with a teacher, but you may, if you have 30 children in the, in the classroom, maybe they need to hire um, teacher helpers or whatever you wanna call it um, so that they can do breakout groups or whatever, but that should be built into the system um, so that there should be no more than, I'm just going to give an example, 10, per, 10 children per one uh, leader or, you know, guide, guide, guidance person, um, other than just the main teacher in the classroom. So those are things that I just wanted to share. Thank you. I am reminded of um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs that I guess from the 60s, that pyramid that builds on the ground level are indeed the physiological needs of food and shelter and clothing and basics uh, before then you build up from there. That that's just ground level for sure that needs to be addressed before I, this next one was like health or safety, security, personal safety and security and so on. Um, at the top you have that self-actualization, but you have to build along the way, of course. and. Um, Anyway, it just came to mind. I think love and belonging, esteem, things build, of course, which is what I'm hearing. And there is great need for building on the very basic levels for much of humanity. Hi, this is Tina. I have several thoughts. Um, the trend here in the States is to move from competition to collaboration. That, like, even if they play soccer, everybody gets a trophy, no matter what level they are, if they win or lose, kind of leading towards that collaboration and, and moving away from competition. That competition is what creates the separativism. Working towards collaboration will create a sense of unity with others, which leads to another thought that I had about working towards the common good with the children to separate them out into service groups. Um, There's some that children that would have more caring nature and you, they would learn how to care for it objects for animals for people um, that group would be, have a common goal of caring another group would have a common goal of doing or giving um, along the service aspect of it and in that they would learn harmlessness um, and then there was um, learning also that from a common 
goal that each one had that they together would have a common purpose and that common purpose with the goals as long as the goals were beneficial and in line with the common good that in this process they would learn to work with the common purpose all together of doing good having working for the common good um, there would be students that would naturally not want to do this and then they would be in a group of learning how to the science of u-turning they would work together on how to turn around their negative nature that they would kind of gravitate towards and turn it into a positive nature um, so that would be a whole science of and of itself working with the children with the different backgrounds that come in negative and resistance to working together as a group and then the other thought i had was about learning science learning the energies that's common between the atom and the human and the universe creates that sense of unity within them having them look at the sky and see that awe of oneness with that what they see in the sky and what's beyond that so basic knowledge of science which um i uh, in the future a lot of children will come in with clairvoyance clairaudience etc with the um, etheric vision and so they need to know the science of the energies they'll need to know how to work with light and sound and so the schools the teachers in the future will have to be able to work with the children, maybe perhaps along the ways, but also along their abilities that they come into incarnation with. And so they'll need to understand the science of working with sound and light and energy. Thank you. It's Rebecca again. Um, Thanks, Tina. And so much of what people are saying, it just keeps on bringing to me the expectations that we have of teachers again and again. And so um, I, I'm just, it just is really sitting with me how much knowledge a teacher needs on deep levels if to be able to do this kind of thing that we're talking about um, and so again I'm sort of feeling we, we need to have a much deeper way of um, training and supporting and nurturing teachers um, and these these ideas about the ray analysis and everything that have come in um, you know, that brings up this idea too of what the teachers, what gets taught to the children explicitly and implicitly. So um, in terms of the developmental process that children go through, we've got our psychological development process, but we got what we also know from um, the esoteric teachings and um, I believe DK speaks about seven year cycles in education and so does Rudolf Steiner. Um, in somewhere I've read um, DK speaking about seven year cycles and he actually refers to Rudolf Steiner's work and he says, I'm talking about something different from Rudolf Steiner. But the bottom line is that there's a knowledge about the, the seven year cycle and the way that um, the human being develops and the young human being develops into adulthood. So I'm thinking, you know, it may be that the teacher has this knowledge about the rays, but it's not that the children get taught about the rays in school. That's something that they come to old when they're older and they're mature for spiritual teaching. But the teachers need to know how to wield this knowledge and the schools in, in the way that they develop the education process. And as you were just speaking about, Tina, about um, the different groups, um, and there's this idea of putting um, children in groups where they have an affinity, and that seems really important. Um, but I also noticed throughout DK's teachings, um, when he speaks about group composition, 
he also often speaks about bringing together different rays and that seems to be very important um, to be actually creating groups where the ray compositions are all getting expressed and balancing and helping each other to create a whole. Um, and especially um, what happens in education now often is that the children who seem to be negative or who are slower at learning all get put into a group and um, they feel like they're the stigmatized dummies or whatever. Um, and I just wonder if a, a heart-centered and more wise way of doing things would be for children who are having difficulties to be in groups with other kids who are really going for it and who are really positive and so that they can experience that energy. And maybe some of those children have got more of a handle on heart-centered pro-social behavior. And so then those, those, those people who are struggling can then be in that environment that supports them instead of being an environment where a whole lot of um, other people are also struggling. I mean, I can see that it would be helpful too for people who are, you know, young people who are struggling to be able to come together and share their experiences as well. So I feel like it's a balance that's needed. And again, it's the wisdom of the teachers to understand the children and to wield the knowledge about the rays and about the learning styles um, to be able to do this. And um, that just seems like such a huge and awesome task to me to be able to have the skill and understanding to do that. And I know there are many skilled teachers that we need to find them and learn from them how we can do things differently. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, it's absolutely right. I mean, um, again, like you say, we're coming to what the teachers, we want teachers to do. And uh, the idea of um, teaching, there, there is a movement, at least in progressive education, uh, to include a variety of types of learners in one classroom. Uh, and there's a lot of, um, also in the progressive schools, there's a lot of sharing of instruction um, in various subjects. You know, one teacher might teach social studies, one teacher might teach uh, um, art, and other teachers teaching science, and they're integrating their curriculum. Um, the thing, too, though, is imagine trying to prepare lessons for a person who is very handicapped as well as a person who's very brilliant in the same classroom, and then all the people in between. It's, it's a challenge. How do you prepare that many lessons each day or, or prepare a lesson that serves that many levels and that many types? It is truly a challenge. And um, there is work going on with this, though. Again, like I say, maybe um, there'll be three fourth grade classes and um, one teacher will teach everyone social studies at some time in the day, and another teacher will teach language arts at the, you know, and then and then projects that integrate all of these. Um, so uh, that's good. That's good to to want this, and we we need to keep working on it together. I think, um, um, and and volunteering, I mean, can really help. Or having, as someone said, having uh, two aides. Uh, in a 30 room, uh, 30 student classroom, that would that helps significantly. Uh, again, we have to have adequate funding for this, though, to uh, pay everyone to do these things. Um, <laughs> there's a lot going on and a lot to do. Uh, thanks. You know, there's a lot in. In this topic and the further we explore the further we start seeing the complexity and in a way our schools is a reflection of our societies so all the complexities we experience in the so to speak adult world uh, they are in the educational system
I suggest we now take all that we shared into the silence and for a couple minutes reflect on most resonant ideas, trying to think of those as seed thoughts for thought forms that we could empower with our meditation and radiate to humanity. So let us now go into that silence that will prepare us for the meditation which Rebecca will lead today. So let us continue to deepen our alignment. Let us recognize our spiritual community, which has been active in our conversation today. Extending beyond us. into contact with that community in a conscious way. And let us sense the warmth of our heart. Open to receive the Christ, and we sense our hearts as they're linked together across distance. And as this warmth of our hearts continues to expand, we acknowledge all those unseen beings who have aided our invocative and evocative efforts on behalf of humanity across the last month, up to this point now. Sensing their presence now. We're at this point following the new moon where we express 
and extend the inspiration received and nourished across the month, especially at the time of the full moon. And we're allowing that fertility to spring forth as new growth that supports the unfolding of the spiritual plan for the evolution of our planet. As we move from the stimulation of conversation into a deeper meditative place, we're aware of the resonance, resonance emerging out of the threads of our conversation. Many sounds, one sound. And as we ground ourselves within this resonance, we consciously align with the group heart, the group heart, the heart of the meditation chalice. We align with our souls. connecting with them through our hearts, with each other's souls, and with all souls. We align with the hierarchy of our planet, under the influence of the spiritual magnetic control of the hierarchy of Sirius, great star of initiation, whose inflowing energies rule the sign of Scorpio under which we're working. Within this atmosphere of Scorpio, we recognize our responsibility as servers within the heart of the world group to enter the battle between the pair of opposites, pairs of opposites. As we strive to purify the dweller on the threshold within the light of the angel of And through this process of struggle and sacrifice, we come receptive to the great balancing and centralizing quality of the Christ and the immeasurable spirit of self-sacrifice, love, and brotherhood that flow from him and our connection to the Christ. We visualize the glowing beauty of the chalice, which our work together feeds and fills. And we connect again with our topic. Awakening heart centered, awakening Christ conscious 
awakening Christ consciousness through heart-centered education. Awakening Christ consciousness through heart-centered education. And we take a few moments to reflect on all that has been said. And perhaps to put it letting our minds play over the threads of the conversation. Connecting with all the ideas that have been expressed today. The layers of thought that have precipitated across this month as the group has vocalized this topic together. Awakening Christ consciousness through heart-centered education. We listen in the receptivity to these threads. And from this place of listening, we allow our seed thought to crystallize now. Opening our minds and hearts to receive some words or images or sentences that capture the essence or the threads from the conversation that seem most meaningful to us. Allowing a seed thought to precipitate. And with love we will offer our seeds into the chalice. Each person speaking as you are moved to. Allowing each seed to rest in the silence for a little while before the next one comes. chalice is open to receive our seeds. Please unmute yourself when you are ready to make your offering. Loving understanding for all beings.
support the teachers. Support the parents. Continuing to refocus again and again on our, our spiritual goals, our heart-centered goals for education as we go through the, the, our daily lives. Um, renew that focus as we approximate these goals, knowing that um, day by day um, improvements are made and advancement is made somehow uh, through the effort. Respect from and for all involved in any learning process. Recognizing individual personalities as reflection of their souls with their current evolutionary needs. Through the law of necessity and evocation of humanity's evolution occurs through heart-centered education, through our use of intuition, discrimination, and relevance, which naturally unfolds the awakening of Christ consciousness within all. Society needs to place value on the importance of the individual, then education will take its rightful place.
let us draw together these seeds and all the numinous surrounding energies of our conversation and our thinking within the chalice. Allowing them to vibrate and resonate within the embracing light of the group vessel. We see and hear and feel the resonance of our combined seeds filling the chalice, vitalizing its radiant light, enhancing the beauty and the wisdom of its tone as its light flows forth. Radiating to all receptive hearts and minds. Thoughts and questions about our centered education. Flowing forth into the world. And as we seal our work together this day, we sound a great invocation. From the point of light, within the mind of God, let light stream forth into human minds. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into human hearts. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men. The purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the race of men, let the plan of love and light work out. And may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth.
Thank you, friends. Thanks, Rebecca. We continue our work, our cyclic meditation. And as we move through this cycle, working with the energy of Scorpio, we will bring our focus to defining the next month's uh, next cycles topic and so we invite you to join the um, coming quarter moon meeting where a circle of uh, which we call the guardians of the purpose get together to share impressions on what are the most resonant ideas and needs of humanity that we could bring into the focus of our work for the next cycle and um, we we'll, by now we, we have more or less stable group of people who participate in this work from month to month and so we invite you to consider leading meditation at the full moon and the new moon gathering of our circle and in a way holding the topic in focus throughout the month so please consider thank you and much love to all